Let's bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day to gather together like this as your children, as your sheep, sheep of your flock and adopted ones. We're so grateful and thankful that you did all the work required to save us on that cross. We thank you that it really has nothing to do with our labor or our worthiness, but as unworthy ones, you've taken us and made us new through the blood of Christ, through the resurrection. Father, right now we ask that you help us forget about the details of life, whatever's going on at home and at work and things like that, because you, we know you care about those things, and right now you want us to concentrate on your word and hear your message for us today to strengthen us and empower us to live a life in Christ. Father, we ask all these things based on the merits of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Spirit, we pray. Amen. Okay, Proverbs 17, Wisdom, Part 104. So, the Lord has been teaching us a certain attitude the last few lessons that he wants us to carry around with us. And uh, we learned it mainly from Daniel in his prayer in Daniel chapter 9. So let's start this way with this reminder on the board regarding a godly righteous attitude. It's not only one of humility, but one of compassion towards our fellow man. And to be honest with you, when I even like wrote this down and the Spirit had me put these two things together, I don't normally think about a godly righteous attitude as one of humility and compassion. I think of righteousness, justice, right? Doing the right thing. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's an all-encompassing attitude to have a godly, righteous attitude, right? It, it involves a lot of things, how God thinks in a lot of different areas. But one thing that we often maybe get too familiar with or dismiss is compassion. You know, we love the Lord's compassion toward us, but we don't really like to have compassion towards others. You know, our flesh does not anyway. And we, we like to forget about that one. So anyway... Right now, this is the emphasis. A godly, righteous attitude includes not only humility, but one of compassion towards our fellow man. And this lines up with being the salt of the earth as God's righteous servants. This has been the whole message, right? Said in different ways, the whole message last uh, week or two. And as I've been reading through the Old Testament prophets recently, one thing that comes through very clearly is God's anger towards those who lived unrighteously. In particular, those that didn't have compassion on the poor and the needy. He hates when people don't have compassion on the poor and needy. He wants to discipline those folks to wake them up of such evil. In his eyes, that is great evil. So what we have here is, rather than a selfish attitude, the way we always think about self and even take advantage of others around us, even those less fortunate, to, to benefit ourselves. Instead of that, he's saying it's righteous to maintain a compassionate attitude towards all, even our enemies. That's part of the message of being salty. So again, on the board, a godly righteous attitude, it's not only one of humility, but one of compassion towards a fellow man. For this reason, we must rely upon the Lord when we're dealing with others because we need his help. We can't be compassionate on our own. Let's face it, sometimes we don't feel like it. We're tired. I don't know about you, but when I'm tired, I'm cranky. I have a short temper. I, uh, you know, I don't have that patience that I should have or might even normally have. So we need his help when we're dealing with others to live in this. On the board, gracious words show love. We must ask for his spirit to fill us and guide us into his steadfast love. Lord, help me stay in that seat 
in that saddle. Help me stay in that position where, where your steadfast love is my motivation and guidance. And in this way, we can operate as the preserving salt of the earth that we have been designed to be as born-again believers. But we have to rely on Him. You know, we've talked about that in different ways too, right? What, do, what or who is your soul relying on? for your strength, for your motivation, for your wisdom? Are you leaning on the Lord in your heart when you're dealing with people? We need it. We need Him really badly. So, on the board, combine, combine this thought with the next one on the board. Have salt in yourselves. Let's pay attention as to why there is suffering in our lives, both personally and as a country. God just might want us to repent not only for ourselves, but for others too, but stop living for ourselves and instead act as salt on behalf of our people. This has been a main part of our messages lately. It's a, it's a wonderful choice before us to continue to be occupied with ourselves, which is misery, or to make the choice to turn around, turn away from our sin and turn away from our evil, repent towards God and be like, Lord, I want to be useful. I want to be good, uh, do good for your purposes. And that involves others. And when you get your eyes on others, you are set free from your bondage to, to self, which is horrible and ugly and sad and depressing. We have the chance to forget about ourselves, stop living for yourself, and act as salt on behalf of our people and make an eternal impact on many lives have a peace in that. So this is another example of humility being aggressive. To obey God's call, we have to do something. We have to turn around from our arrogant, selfish lifestyle and take action and reach out to those around us with grace. That's aggressive, to obey God like that. You actually have to do something, right? So it's up to you, but that's the kind of biblical humility that follows Christ, that forgets about self and just almost runs with abandon towards the cross and his purposes for you. It's a beautiful thing that is designed to set us free and bring tremendous glory to God. If we're truly humble, we'll receive this calling to live as the salt of the earth, Live in that instead of remaining self-focused. And this involves both gracious speech and actions towards others and also prayer on others' behalf. It involves actions for the benefit of others and also prayer on their behalf when you're not around others or communicating with others. So this, that's kind of two distinct ways we can have the saltiness that Christ desires us to live in. You know, when you're interacting with people, fine speech maybe, actions, giving, serving, showing undeserved kindness, which you're going to get to tonight, grace in action. And then also there's the praying for others, pleading to God for others, for forgiveness and mercy and patience. So last week, the Lord confronted us about our religious ways, meaning we must be wary of going to church and or doing certain godly things with the wrong heart, with a heart that tries to just appease him, to get by and keep God at arm's length. That's what religion does. And God sees right through that, of course. So the Spirit's got a little bit more testing of our hearts to do this evening. And again, as a reminder, don't be scared of this. It's, it's the initial reaction to be scared of this. Like, I don't want God to test my heart and see everything as though he doesn't already. But that's our reaction. This is for our good to be set free. God loves us. He wants us to be set free from all these bondages. So say, Lord, test my heart. Show me where I'm off. Even if I'm going to cringe, even if it's evil, show me so I can repent of it and Give it to you and move on. So here are the questions for our hearts to consider again. On the board, whom do you love? 
we each should ask ourselves, what has our heart been set on lately? Are you regularly, nobody's perfect, but are you regularly setting your heart on the Lord or on yourself and the things of this world? Another way that the Spirit stated this on Sunday was, with the majority of your time, who are you intent on pleasing? The Lord or yourself? What's in your mind? Who are you intent on pleasing? The flesh? Making sure your comforts don't go anywhere? Or are you intent on pleasing the Lord the majority of your time? That's a good test to see where our hearts are at. Uh, think of Hebrews 4.12 when we talk about our intentions, right? On the board, like, actually that word's not on the board, but who are you intent on pleasing? Hebrews 4.12 talks about God discerning the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. So who are you intent on pleasing? Right? Again, on the board, we should each ask ourselves, what has our heart been set on lately? Are you regularly setting your heart on the Lord or on yourself and the things of this world? As the Spirit's been saying to us in a variety of ways, on the board, whom do you love? We must acquire God's love as our motivation to be rescued from slavery to false lovers in this world. It's like without God's love, we are powerless. We don't have the right viewpoint. We get, it's almost like having nothing to work with versus having everything to work with. We must acquire God's love as our motivation to be rescued from slavery to false lovers in this world. The Old Testament often describes Israel as cheating on God. Uh, a lot of very graphic words, actually, even whoring around. The nation leaving the God who created them and saved them and going to other nations and other gods for what pleases their flesh, basically. So are we doing the same in our hearts? That's what God has been asking us. And you might say, oh, I'm not cheating on God. What do you mean? I don't worship other gods. I don't have little statues in my house that I ask things of. <laughs> give me this, give me that. So this was our test on the board. Cheating on God. Are you looking to the world and its ways to provide financial excess for you? Not being content with where God has you but wanting to get ahead and have some wealth, do you turn to the world's ways? If so, you're cheating on God. He's your provider. He's your provider. He can make you wealthy tomorrow if he wants to, without any help from you. And yet, we don't believe him. We don't trust him. Or we get selfish and just plain want it now, so we look to another source. How insulting that is to our Heavenly Father. In other words, why are you looking to other lovers in the world to take care of you? God Almighty is your Father, and it doesn't get any better than that. So again, on the board, are you cheating on God? Are you looking to the world and its ways to provide financial excess? Not being content with what, where God has you right now? There's a reason you are where you are right now. There's a reason you might not have excess. It might not be the best thing for you right now. And who needs excess when God can give you anything and take care of anything at any time for you? We think we need all these things. It's really just a lack of faith, right? Anyway, if we're looking to the world and their ways to gain some wealth, we're cheating on God. Here's another example the Spirit brought up on Sunday. Cheating on God. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Are you seeking shortcuts to gain love through lust? Or are you turning to the world to be loved and included and accepted? If so, you're cheating on God. God wants you to know that through Christ Jesus, He accepts you fully, despite who you are and your weaknesses. So he wants to be our love. He loves us far more than we can ever realize. 
And for help at this, the Spirit mentioned the passion of Christ on the cross. And thinking of his passion on the cross, the Lord led me to read the last two chapters of each of the four Gospels as a personal reminder for his loving steadfastness for us. You want to see steadfast love? Steadfast love means you keep going straight ahead for the sake of those you're loving, right? You don't even look to the right or to the left. You certainly don't look behind you. You, you are so committed and so focused because of love that you keep your face forward. And he, the Lord did that from the trials with the Jewish religious people to Pontius Pilate trials, right, to the walk on the road to the place of the skull, carrying the cross, right? Talk about having steadfastness. And then on the cross, having the power to come down if he wanted to and choosing to stay there. It's beyond our grasp. But that's the passion that we can look towards to be reminded. It's interesting how um, we can turn a blind eye to the fact that our heart is looking for substitutes for God. And it's really, you know, so sad. And thank God he's so patient and forgiving, right? Because we sin every day in some way, probably in this area, looking for some kind of substitute for love or provisions. Again, the point on the board, cheating on God, are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Are you like preoccupied, you know? And if you are, you're not content with his love. So it requires prayer, right? It requires getting on our knees and pleading for mercy and wisdom and power. So just these are our tests to see if we're following other gods. If you think about it, we are really so unfaithful towards the one who's faithful towards us. And if you don't think you'd have, have that much sin to repent from, uh, you know, we talked about repent from your wicked ways. I think that was in Daniel too. Um, just consider those two examples we just talked about of our unfaithfulness. Where does unfaithfulness begin? Right? In our hearts, in our intentions. That's where it begins. Everything on the outside could look perfect. You could be putting on a great show, right? Coming to church, looking good in front of other people. They don't know what you're thinking. So you think you're skating by, but God's looking at your heart going, oh, please repent. Please come back to me. Please let me be your only source. And that's our daily walk with him. So back to our calling. On the board, have salt in yourselves. Are we so busy living for self, doing whatever is necessary to maintain our own comfort level that we ignore our calling to be the salt of the earth. What, what a, um, a case of missing out, right? Uh, and what a bad exchange. Maintain your comfort level or live as salt of the earth, which basically means for others. What a bad exchange. You know, there's no value in the comfort level thing, right? It, maintaining that. It's such a tempor temporary maintaining pennies pennies worth of value in exchange for the eternal wealth that God has for us so again on the board are we so busy living for self doing whatever is necessary to maintain our comfort level that we ignore our calling to be the salt of the earth what a privilege this is a great question for those of us who think that we are committed to the Lord and it's not a call to condemnation. It's a call to a reality check on our spiritual walk, on our hearts. As we learned from Daniel, do we ignore our duty and privilege to go to God and plead for mercy for ourselves and others? And God is so eager to hear it. He is so happy to hear it when we come to him with that attitude. On the board, have salt in yourselves. Why aren't we eagerly and passionately praying for our people like Daniel did? Do we not love them? 
This pleases the Lord so much. Do you remember Daniel chapter 9 when, when the angel came to Daniel and said, your prayers were heard immediately and a word was sent out even before you began, basically. And the angel said, you are greatly loved. God loves when we come to him like this in humility. Daniel loved God and God's word, but we were also reminded by the Spirit. He, Daniel wasn't always like this. Daniel was an older person, not a younger person at this point in his life. Over time, he became like this. He grew into this. How did he grow into it? Because he loved God and he loved God's word. And he said, I want to know you, Lord. You know, I want to be on the same track as you. Think like you. Do what pleases you. And this enabled Daniel to act as salt for his people. Many of us have been in the word for years, right? How long are we going to use the excuse <laughs> that we can't be the salt of the earth because we're not able or I need to make sure my life is okay or something like that, right? Let's face it. I mean, we could live in a cardboard box. We could live in a studio apartment with no furniture. We'd be fine. It's up here that we think we wouldn't be fine, right? We think we need these things that, I don't know. It's amazing how you can be happier when you lose things after, you know. At first, it's a shock. You lose certain things, and you're like, you know what? My life's a lot simpler. Uh, my distractions are taken out of the way. I have peace. So let's get back to our religious ways and how we try to appease God but keep him at arm's length. Turn in your Bibles again to Hosea chapter 5, verse 12. Hosea 5, 12. It is possible to be a church-going person and have our hearts be far from him. And this is why we uh, examine ourselves and ask God also to examine our hearts. Hosea 5, verse 12. But I am like a moth to Ephraim and like dry rot to the house of Judah. So God says this, the one who knows their hearts precisely. God's not guessing this is what they're thinking about him like we would guess. He knows this is what they think about him. I am like a moth to Ephraim and like dry rot to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king. But he is not able to cure you and heal your wound. Then God says in verse 14, For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off, and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress earnestly seek me. Do you see the attitude God is waiting for our hearts to have? Something genuine, not something superficial, like religion. But... Israel and Judah are unrepentant, as we saw. And look at what they say. Look at what they say. But apparently they were not sincere. They were trying to get out of their situation. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, on the third day he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. And look at what God says. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire the steadfast love, I, de I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. 
As we saw on Sunday, their love faded away like the morning dew. It wasn't real or sincere. It was self-serving to get out of the discipline. God is saying in verse 6, I desire your steadfast love. I don't know about you, but I never saw the meaning of the verse like this. And, and context always shows it, right? God's saying, I don't want that fly-by-night love that you're pretending to have for me so you can escape the judgment. I want real love. I want steadfast love. I want you to come to me as your father and stay with me and seek to get to know me, not try to please me with your religion. So on the board, this is a good way we might put it. The Lord deserves steadfast love in return. If anyone does, he does. God knows when we are loving him for what he can give us. How sad does that make a parent when their child is unappreciative and doing that ugly thing? And parents know, right? You know when your kids are faking it to try to get out of it, right? You just know. And it's, it, it sucks, right? I can't imagine. I'm not a parent. But I, I can only imagine. So God knows when we're loving him that way for what he can give us or get us out of. But the Lord deserves steadfast love in return. This is where humility comes in, right? We're just arrogant if we're loving God in this superficial way. And there's a real surrender to loving him back steadfastly. Anyway, we just saw that in Hosea 6, 1 through 6, and also we're going to see that in 7, 14. So turn to Hosea 7, verse 13. Hosea 7, 13. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. And I just want to say something real quick. A lot of people, some people that read the Bible and they read passages like this where God is intent on destruction. They don't realize that God has let them slide hundreds of times, we could say. They don't realize if you read your Bible how many times they rebelled against God and refused to repent. They also don't realize things like when they worship these false gods in the Old Testament, they were participating not only in cheating on God, but in evil things, as far as, even as far as putting the children to death. That's what they were doing, the Jews, the Israelites, with these false gods, trying to please these other false gods by putting the children to death. And people get upset with God that God's going to judge them and destroy them. What a mean God. What would you do if your children were putting their children to death? What would you do? Would you step in if you could? And God yet, even with that, was more patient than he should have from our perspective. God's heart is, I want to forgive them, but they refuse to come back to me. I've waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited way more than we realize. But they speak lies against me, he says in verse 13. So just keep that perspective and defend the Lord when people uh, try to come down on him for destruction in the Old Testament and judgment and discipline. Defend the Lord and tell him what was really going on. So, verse 14, here was their heart. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds for grain and wine. They gash themselves. They rebel against me. I mean, I picture a kid on his bed face down doing this with his hands on his feet, right? Why, are, why can't I have it now? They were trying to get stuff from God in their timing. They had no true humility. Amazing. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. They're worried about what they're not getting, not about a loving, appreciative relationship with the one who created them and provides for them. Verse 15, although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me, says God. 
They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. You want to go places, God says, like Assyria and Egypt for help? Healing your wounds? Getting out of a financial jam? You're going to suffer for it because you're cheating on your creator and provider. As came out on Sunday, it's like us going to New York or L.A. or even Boston, like a prosperous city, seeking a way out, seeking a better life, seeking wealth and riches by the world's way. Good luck with that. You want to go to the world for prosperity and healing, you will get what you ask for, you will reap what you sow. So God is saving us right now. He's like, if you've been thinking that at all, just stop it, repent from that, and come back to me. I'll take care of you in every way, in my timing, because I'm good. On the board, God is good. But what can we do but repent from the heart? And isn't it great to know that's what all God wants from us? True repentance? What can we do but repent from the heart? Thank God that he gives us such a gracious, simple rescue from our evil thoughts, like cheating on him elsewhere, right? He is eager to forgive us and restore us. Don't forget that. Don't get condemned. Don't ever think you've gone too far. Listen, there are people that have gone really far into gross things, right? Maybe you've done it. Maybe I've done it. Everyone's got their own opinion of gross, I guess, right? But <laughs> we've all gone to places that are unforgivable, and God is eager to forgive us. He's not holding it against you. He's like, just turn around. Come back to me with all your heart. Don't play games. I'm here. I want to bless you. And the example, there's many examples of this throughout the word. But the example he has for us tonight is in Joel 2. So why don't you turn there. It's the very next book, right after Hosea. Joel 2, verse 11. And before we read this, one more time, the point on the board, God is good. What else can we do but repent from the heart? Thank God he gives us such a gracious, simple rescue from our evil thoughts. He is eager to forgive us and restore us. Joel 2, verse 11. We're just going to read through this. And I want you to sit back and get the, get the, get the whole feeling of the passage, okay? See God's heart in the passage. Because the first 10 verses of this chapter, it's God talking about the day of the Lord, judgment, God coming to wipe out his enemies. And the first 10 verses describe how thoroughly he wipes out his enemies like an army wipes out everything in its path. Okay? God's saying, that's going to come one day. It has to come one day. For those who ultimately refuse to repent, there has to be a righteous judgment. But look at verse 11. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet even now, declares the Lord. In other words, like right before the army is about to overtake you, and you deserve to be overtaken. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. There, my friends, is a picture of the righteousness of godly sorrow. That is a very good thing to come to God in this way for the things we have done against Him. It's the right response, in other words. Again, look at verse 12. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. The Bible says God does not want to perform disaster, destruction. There's many passages I've been reading in the prophets where he relents over disaster. He would rather not. 
He's like, turn to me before I have to go through with this. Look at verse 14. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. That's the heart of the Lord, his desire for repentance, even down to the last second before judgment. So, again, on the board, God is good. He's waiting like the father waited for the prodigal son to return, as in Luke 15, 11 through 32. He's eagerly looking for our hearts to return to him alone as our provider. That's the message. He's our provider, no one else. Look again at verse 27. Joel 2.27 You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. God deserves to be the only one we look to and he's the only one that can provide anyway. But he's a jealous God. There's no one besides me. And my people, the ones that turn to me, my people shall never again be put to shame. That's what God wants. Again, on the board, he's good. He's waiting like the father waited for the prodigal son to return. He's eagerly looking for our hearts to return to him alone as our provider. Where are your hearts? What has your heart been looking to for pleasure, for provisions? He's the only one. He wants to be the only one, and he deserves it. And he's eager to forgive. You've never gone too far, if you're still alive on earth and you can breathe, you've never gone too far where you can't repent and turn back to God and ask forgiveness and plead for mercy. So, changing gears now, it's when our hearts are right with God that we can be of most use to Him and live as the salt of the earth that He intended us to be. You could be totally unrighteous and evil in your thoughts and your ways. But if you repent to God like he asks you to repent from the heart, you can have a whole new life, right? 
And this is as a believer, too. You can turn from the garbage in your soul that you've been clinging to, and you can go to him and say, I'm yours. Use me. Use me. I'm done with my own ways. I want to be the salt of the earth you intended me to be. So back to the role that we have to play in this with fine speech. On the board, fine speech, truly encouraging words, can protect and even help preserve the hearts and faith of others, whether believers or unbelievers. Two weeks ago now, we saw examples of our, our Lord's own gracious speech. It was really wonderful. I hope you enjoyed it. It was just great, the examples he gave us, how the Lord was gracious in his speech and how he seasoned it with salt of the truth. So here's what we witnessed one more time in a nutshell when we read the Gospel of John, or his words in the Gospel of John, on the board, our Lord's fine speech. Jesus masterfully reached out to sinners with gracious words, and he added reminders of the truth of their sinful situations to help them be humble going forward. Like a master, right? A masterpiece. Just like art, like dancing, like someone who perfectly knows the balance. And he executed it for our great example. The honey and the salt. Of course, we, when we communicate to people, we've been encouraged to make sure people understand we're in the same boat as them. We're no better than them whatsoever. But we can learn from this pattern on the board that the Lord showed us. We can operate in that pattern. What is grace but an expression of love? That's what grace is. On the board, we've been told to always have gracious speech. Proverbs 16, 24 says, Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the body. And Colossians 4, 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Always have gracious speech. That's the main encouragement for us. We don't have the right to judge. Um, we don't have the right to take vengeance on our enemies, right? God says, vengeance is mine. You give that to me. You be gracious. You heap burning coals on their heads with the, your kindness and your love for them even when they're attacking you. And let me handle the rest. Our job is to have gracious speech. In the Greek, the word gracious is the word charis, as many of you know, and it means the best simple, powerful definition, undeserved kindness. Undeserved kindness. This means being gracious with our words, even towards those who insult us and don't deserve it. To be kind and even edifying to those who mock us. That's our job. That's our calling. God was that way to you. When you were an unbeliever or you were listening to the truth, but you scoffed at it, when you went, what, how, what, how big an insult is that to God? Right? You did that. I did that. So he was kind and even edifying and patient with us. When we mocked him, we are to pass on that patience and kindness that leads people to repentance. Just look at the kindness Jesus showed unworthy sinners. Now in the Hebrew of Proverbs 16, 24, the word gracious means agreeableness. Agreeableness. For example, delight, suitableness, splendor, or grace. I'll probably put this on the board for you on Sunday. But just to have a mindset of this word gracious, and we're told to always have gracious speech, what does that mean? We've seen undeserved kindness and agreeableness. In other words, you're not, your job isn't to confront people or to be uh, confrontational. Your job is to kill them with kindness. Uh, be agreeable as much as is possible with you. Be at peace with all men. Be agreeable. Uh, show undeserved kindness. 
So, on the board, always have gracious speech. These gracious kinds of words are sweet as honey to the soul because they do not seek strife, but just the opposite. They are a call to love. They are a call to love. Undeserved love. To love someone when they're being a jerk to you. These words that we can use are powerful. Sweet as honey to the soul because it's not like the rest of the world comes at people seeking strife or comparison, but just the opposite. They're a call to love. In other words, they don't put others to the test, trying to one-up another person, right, to make self feel better about self. It's not that anymore for us. It's the opposite. So gracious speech is motivated by God's selfless love. So turn in your Bibles to a passage we'll read in context in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. First Timothy 2, 1. Again, gracious speech is motivated by God's selfless love. And here we're going to see God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6. We're going to also see what that in involves. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. This should sound familiar because that's what we saw with Daniel in chapter 9 of Daniel. That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. There, my friends, is living righteously like the salt of the earth is supposed to live. See that? Godly and dignified in every way. That's being, that's giving the example of the salt of the earth, being a preserving type of person. Verse 3. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Again, the point is that gracious speech is motivated by God's selfless love. So selfless that in verse 6 he became a ransom for us. And this is the message we are to spread. This is why we are to be gracious. What's more gracious than being a ransom for others who are guilty? So on the board, always have gracious speech. Fine gracious speech is about the well-being of the one you are speaking to to the exclusion of self. That's our challenge, is when we speak to others to get ourselves totally out of, the well, out of the way. Forget how you feel in the moment. Forget what you might be going through. Don't make it about yourself. Make it about them and the Lord. The Lord and them. Right? Fine, gracious speech is about the well-being of the one you are speaking to to the exclusion of self. This is how we should be when sharing the gospel. We don't make it about ourselves. We make it about the sacrificial love of our Lord and Savior and how He cares for them. He has a desire to see them saved. Jesus talked about leaving the 99 sheep behind to go save the one that was lost. You've got to picture that scene in your head. If that was you in the field with 100 sheep and you just realized you're missing one. It is extremely selfless if you're going to leave the 99 behind and go after that one sheep that might already be dead. Why am I going to go after that one sheep? I still got 99. It's such a beautiful day. See, it's about me if you're going to stay with those 99. It's about me. Your comfort. Jesus is the opposite of our flesh. 
He talked about leaving the 99 behind to go to save the one that was lost. If that's not a picture of selfless love, I don't know what is. And if that's his loving attitude, that should be ours as well. Let's imitate the Lord. So on the board, as we begin to close, always have gracious speech. Even if we're being insulted by others, we choose to look past that and treat them in the undeserved kindness we were treated with by the Lord. We were all lost at one point. So that means he came and sought us out, even though he had 99 with him already. Again on the board, even if we're being insulted by others, we choose to look past that and treat them with undeserved kindness that we were treated with by the Lord. In other words, we make it about the glory of his grace. Ephesians 1.6 says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's what we make it about. His grace is so marvelous. You have to know. I want to explain this to you. It's so glorious that even to the depths that you've been, even about the sins you don't want to tell me about right now, he has paid for that. If you come to him in humility, you receive what he did for you, what he purchased for you. Make it all about his selfless act on the cross. You might even say to someone that you're dealing with, you don't have to like me. I understand. Because you see, you're, you're telling them, you're affronting them. You're basically telling them they're a sinner and they need to be saved, right? And no one wants to hear they're a sinner. So you're affronting them. You're offending them in a way. But you have to tell the truth, right? And you might see a scowl on their face. And you might say, literally, you know what? You don't have to like me. I understand. I get it. I was where you are right now. But this is about the Lord and his kindness toward you that he wants you to receive. Make it all about the Lord and the glory of his grace. So I we'll guess we'll close with this passage. Go to 1 Peter 3, verse 13. 1 Peter 3, 13. Peter lays this out nicely for us. 1 Peter 3, 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Don't give them anything to accuse you of, that you were impatient with them or mean to them. Don't give them any of that, so they can make no excuses when they hear the word of the Lord, the grace of the Lord. Love wins is really what we're talking about. Love always wins. And grace is an expression of love. Notice in verse 16, uh, verse 15, I guess, how we are to make a defense. 15 and 16. How are we to make a defense? With gentleness and respect. Often when we make a defense, we get defensive, don't we? Our flesh gets defensive. How come you're, not, you're challenging me what I'm telling you right now? Why aren't you believing me? We get defensive. That's not how we make a, de a godly defense. We do it with gentleness and respect. We need to sit back and be slow to speak and let the love of Christ control us. And the good news is any of us can do this. It doesn't matter how bad of a speaker we think we are. It doesn't matter, um, you know, if we're dyslexic, right? We, we always mix our words. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. If we sit back and we're slow to speak, God will fill our mouths. 
If we let the love of Christ control us, God will fill our mouths. It's when we rush to judgment, right? When we get defensive. Why aren't you listening to me? No, no, no. Relax. Be gentle, right? Be gentle and respectful. And let God fill your mouth. Let the love of Christ control you. So I guess with that, we should turn to our last verse because it fits perfectly. Go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. I've got two minutes left, perfect amount of time. Hang in there. I know it's a Thursday night. Tired from work. But let's, let's right now let the love of Christ control us. And let's see why the love of Christ controls us. Look at verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore... Regard no one according to the flesh. Very powerful passage to think about. Again, we need to sit back, be slow to speak, and let the love of Christ control us. And if we rely on the Spirit, He will lead us to make a defense with gentleness and respect, always being gracious in our speech. So with that in mind, let's close and we'll continue with this on Sunday. Father, we thank you so much for this guidance and inspiration from your spirit and your word. We thank you for the examples you give us, especially from our Lord and Savior. His incredible grace and truth coming out in a perfect balance. Help us, Father, to be that way and to defend you not defensively, but with gentleness and respect and a good conscience. Father, we ask all these things based on the merits of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we ask these things in the power of your Spirit. Amen.